from CGTN headquarters in Beijing. This is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub on CGTN and Wang Guan in Beijing. It is political season and China's annual national meetings known as the two sessions are scheduled next week. The government work report is expected to announce the Chinese government's growth target and the overall direction of its economic, social and foreign policy development for the year 2024. What will be some of this year's main growth drivers and what does it say about China's path to modernization? Earlier I talked to Michele Garacci. Professor Garacci is the former Under Secretary of State at the Italian Ministry of Economic Development responsible for international trade and investment. He spent some 10 years in China where he worked as a microeconomist and professor of finance in various universities. Take a listen. Professor Jirachi, thank you for joining us again. It's great to have you on the hub here on CGTN. Uh, let's talk about the Chinese economy. There are many theories going around these days, uh, mostly concerning uh, the prospect of the Chinese economy potentially peaking. This China peak theory has been very popular, saying that the Chinese model of growth has finally uh, run out of steam. And uh, uh, given what happened in the last couple of years, the Chinese economy probably will never go back to its heydays, let's say. Um, do you agree with that uh, prediction? What is your sense of the Chinese economy now that you have been living in China on the ground for many years? Uh, thank you for reminding me. Uh, we have to remember that there are some economists, uh, analysts, uh, even famous, uh, that have been predicting uh, the collapse of China for the last uh, 20, 25 years. We have some famous books uh, uh, come out in the year 2000, uh, and then on and on, everyone, the many Western analysts, uh, predicting the end of the China uh, model. And I want to say two things. First of all, uh, the the interesting thing of the China model is that it adapts to the situation of the time. So, uh, in a way, uh, some of them may be correct to say that that was the end of the China model, but they did not predict that China would uh, introduce a new model of development that would continue to give the country a very good, reasonable uh, growth. So, we should think of China model as uh, a series of models that take into consideration the situation of the time, domestic, international, and adapt uh, with the goal to continue a certain level of uh, growth. So let's not, uh, we analysts, we should not talk about China model, but rather a evolving Chinese model, almost like a Darwinian that adapts itself uh, to the challenges of the time. Uh, then, of course, uh, if you refer to the heydays when Chinese growth was uh, 9, 10% and even more, those are uh, gone. But uh, let's not forget that even a 4 or 5% growth for the future out of a, a higher base, it is uh, even larger in uh, uh, money terms than a 10% growth of 15 years ago when the base was uh, much uh, uh, lower. And it is a natural economic process. The growth rate uh, do not stay at uh, double digit or high single digit by subsidized to middle single digit. So in my view, a growth of uh, four, five percent for the next five years for China would be very, very good. But talking about what's happening right now to the Chinese economy, uh, you know, household consumption has been sluggish. Uh, compared to many developed countries. Uh, household consumption has been lagging in the past. Uh, it is picking up a little bit over the past couple of months with uh, the Lunar New Year coming up, the Spring Festival. Uh, travel rush, uh, people spending more on uh, necessities, not only that, but also travel, um, outbound travel, tourism, uh, restaurants, uh, hotels. Um, what are your observations regarding the stimulus packages uh, China has uh, implemented over the past couple of months to stimulate its economy. Do you think it will work? I think uh, it may work. It is challenging because you are right. The tourism is uh, the easiest one that we observe over the last few weeks. And indeed, uh, is showing signs uh, of being at a level which are higher even than the pre-COVID 2019. So it seems that we have passed these three or four years of COVID. On the other hand, however, the consumption is uh, challenging uh, because uh, uh, consumer confidence uh, after these three years of various challenges, domestic, international, COVID and so on, restriction, lockdown and so on, it is low. And it is natural that it is low because consumers need to regain that uh, trust. The real estate 
and the stock market do not help because uh, even if uh, uh, the value of the investment in the stock market does not represent a large proportion of uh, individuals' wealth, the perception uh, that people do domestic uh, consumers is that if the stock market goes down, it's an indication that the future of the economy is not very good. But how and do you think the Chinese consumers can pick up confidence in their economy, in society, uh, whereby they can safely and surely spend more? They can make it easy for, for example, tax reforms for companies so the profit could increase, uh, some subsidies in the industry that are uh, also strategically important, so that this uh, Shanghai index uh, starts to pick up again. And then the other thing is the real estate market, of course, which is a form of saving. You know, people, you want people to consume. So we need to tell them what to do with the money. They can either spend or can they, or can they either consume. And again, the real estate is very important for the wealth factor. When people think they, have, they are rich, even if it's a nominal wealth that is on paper, they do spend more of their income. And finally, overall trust in the uh, future. Now, what uh, I think the Chinese government is doing very well uh, in this uh, difficult uh, international situation, uh, you may uh, find that the Chinese situation is challenging for consumers, but you should come and see what happens in Europe. We have wars, we have governments that do not deliver to the people. So in relative terms, uh, I think the Chinese government is doing the best it can without interfering too much in the market because then it will give the wrong impression that China may, may move back towards a more closed, more state-run uh, economy. The other thing that I would do is very easy, to open up for foreign investment uh, more. Uh, this is going to be a big boost of confidence uh, for uh, foreign to see that they can play in the Chinese market. Uh, uh, they can make investment, they can uh, uh, acquire company, even in sectors that a few years ago maybe have been considered by the Chinese government to be sensitive or strategic and so not open to foreign investment. But we have moved on over the last few years and what was strategic now maybe is less strategic uh, today. And so there could be some uh, uh, open up. Again, it is not just for the money because we know the inflow of uh, foreign direct investment into China is not determined, but it's the impression that China is open, interacts more with the market, and consumers would feel that then they can play a better role too. Yeah, th that is a fair point. But what sectors are you thinking that China can perhaps start by allowing more foreign investors that uh, were previously, you know, um, not allowed into the Chinese sec those sectors? The one I work in, education, uh, we seems to be going a little bit back to close a little bit more with uh, uh, foreign uh, universities for various reasons. I think this is very important, especially for young consumers uh, to see the, I would like to see flourishing of uh, um, international campus of various international universities, uh, more and more of those. Because if you tell the young people, 18, 19 years old, that uh, uh, there is this base of cooperation at uh, uh, academic level, then they would know that on top of that, there could be opportunities also in the business areas. The other one is technology. Uh, we do know now that China is uh, almost as advanced uh, as other countries, as Korea, as the United States in uh, semiconductor. I think allowing minority stakes, not controlling, but uh, a few percentage point ownership in some of the Chinese big tech stocks would actually be very beneficial for, for, for the economy. Again, not you, you cannot give foreign control of you know, Huawei or SMIC, but a small ownership. And the same for energy. One or two percent in oil, gas company, that does not change the way that the company is run that would also uh, be uh, beneficial because it's all about building consumer confidence and building the understanding that China is open to doing business with the rest of the world. And that, I think, is the unique position mm -hmm. of China today. While other people do wars, if China can tell its own people in the world that it's open again for right. business, and if also that would be good. Professor Jirachi, you talk about the real estate market uh, that has seen price decreases. Uh, for up to 20, 30 percent in some major Chinese cities, and you, you made a very fair point whereby you said, um, you know, with property prices being popped up, uh, those property owners will have a sense of ownership. What can be done at this point to 
really, uh, let's say, salvage, if not salvage, but really help the property market in China? You can do a few things. You can do low mortgage rates for young couples who are the ones who are not able to afford the houses today. Cheap loans, even zero interest rate loans, I don't know, for the next, uh, for the first three, five years, the two young couples who get married, who have children. So at the same time, you incentivize uh, and you try, try to change also the demographic uh, a challenge that China has with declining population. Young people now cannot afford houses in general. So you need to make it cheaper and almost interest rate free until they get to a good level of income and they can they start uh, repaying it. That would uh, help. We can also do something, but it's a bit tricky and needs to be careful to uh, lower, to, to increase the loan to value ratio so that people can maybe buy a little bit more with uh, uh, borrowings. And then I think the other thing that needs to be done is a uh, implementation of a less restrictive migration policies. Because at the end of the day, the real estate market is also uh, driven by the migrants, uh, uh, of course, low income people, but at the base of this pyramid, they do need to go and live somewhere. So if we don't have migrants, uh, we lose uh, 10, 12 million people, new city residents, uh, and therefore that uh, also pulls the market down. We estimate that the migration the rural to urban contributed to do about 0.5, 0.7% of GDP growth, uh, all mm -hmm. coming from direct real estate and indirect effect. So mm -hmm. that uh, is uh, uh, important. And uh, in, in that way, it is also good that the Chinese government uh, does this uh, uh, urbanization in the rural area. So instead of having people moving to the city, and uh, coming from uh, rural areas to Shanghai, they actually urbanize uh, the home country so that the distance is, uh, to travel is not so much. And those houses uh, should be uh, relatively cheaper and therefore more uh, affordable. You know, for the high-end market, the people who have two or three houses, really, uh, so be it. You know, if you speculate on the real estate market, you should be able to take a loss. I believe also the Chinese leadership uh, has... Uh, made it clear that houses are for living, not mm -hmm. for speculation. Professor Girachi, it is about time of China's two sessions, um, the legislative session known as MPC and the political consultative process known as CPPCC. Uh, the growth targets, the economic growth target of Chinese economy is expected to be announced. Usually at this time of the year, it is anyone's guess what will be China's GDP target for the year 2024, but the IMF predicted that China's economy will grow by about 4.6%. What do you think of that estimate? Uh, we really do not care so much what's going to happen in 2024. We care what China is going to do in the next five or 10 years. So if 2024 is 4.8 or 4.5, really nothing matters uh, as long as the long-term uh, prospect and structure of the economy, again, the new model is adjusted. So in the two session, I will look more at this new Darwinian model. What is the leadership going to tell me between now and 2030, rather than the very short term next two quarters uh, uh, GDP forecast? And then what do you think can potentially be the new growth engines of the Chinese economy? We've been hearing about this um, dual carbon goals and also this AI that is taking center stage in many sectors and across many areas. I do believe technology. Technology has always been uh, one of the main engines, and it's one of the four components of the GDP. We cannot increase people, we cannot increase land, we cannot uh, uh, we can increase capital, but the thing is innovation and technology. So I do think the growth engine will be in innovation. China, and this is very little known maybe to foreign audience, is almost getting at par with uh, Silicon Valley in California and uh, other innovation hub in uh, London and in uh, Berlin, uh, Germany, with pri private equity. We need to develop that because that's the engine uh, to fuel this uh, uh, innovation. Uh, so a lot more needs to be done in the venture capital and private equity. It cannot just be the government that uh, uh, finances a large company, but we need this as an ecosystem of small, medium enterprises. And AI, indeed, is one of those that will completely change uh, the dynamics of the industry and it will make it more efficient although we need to be careful because ai also has uh, some high risk of displacing uh, labor force and we are seeing these already happening in uh, in uh, europe yeah uh, last year during an interview with cgtn you said that china delivers so-called ex post democracy uh, can you once again elaborate on that concept 
Uh, in a way, it's a different idea from the Western economy, from the Western political system. In the West, uh, in some of the Western countries, at least, uh, you know, people vote and they choose uh, the uh, member of the government and they almost vote directly for who should be the prime minister and, and the ministers. Uh, and then if the government delivers or not, then uh, people will either change the vote next time, but they cannot do anything during the electoral cycle. So for five years, if they have made a bad choice, they need to bear with it. In China, it's different. China has an alternative system of uh, uh, delivering uh, people's requests to the upper levels of uh, uh, government uh, via surveys uh, and other systems so that the leadership knows what people desire and they also know what is needed uh, for the country. They need to deliver uh, so that they can continue this uh, alliance uh, with, the, with the people. And I think in a way, this is what I mean, ex post. They assess the, his performance, the performance, and then they allow it to continue to be the leader. Key theme expected at this year's two sessions uh, could be the Chinese path to modernization. How would you explain the, the most impressive features of the Chinese path to modernization now that you've been living and studying and working in China for so many years? I, I would approach it from, uh, let's say, one hardware point of view and one software point of view. So the hardware modernization is infrastructure development, uh, high speed rail, metro system in the city, logistics delivery. You can buy something and get it in 20, 48 hours from anywhere to anywhere else in China. So that stimulates a lot to the uh, economy. And that infrastructure is at the basis of this uh, creation of a modern uh, uh, society. And the other one is the software. Because when once uh, you can uh, travel in short period of times so from uh, what used to be distant areas, uh, uh, and now they've been uh, made closer with infrastructure, also the way people think uh, is changes. So that's the software modernization. So a rural citizen now does not see going to Shanghai as uh, maybe the trip of their lifetimes. It is something that they can a, afford, do comfortably, within a short period of time and so the way that people do think they do see this divide between rural and urban to decrease not just because of the income disparity that goes down but also because of the way that people think so in my way the modernization of the society is also bringing what used to be farmers maybe with the little education let them think that they could also be equal par citizen with education with access to infrastructure and technology so both hardware and software this is a unique way that china can deliver and is delivering its modernization professor chirachi always great to pick your mind thank you so much um, please take care thank you